All right, so welcome everyone. We're happy to have uh, for the IQS seminar this week, uh, Robert Kerniak coming to, to speak to us about uh, quantum telescopy. Uh, so Robert is a native of Poland and he's doing his PhD at the University of Rochester uh, with me. And so we've been, been advising him remotely the past couple of years now. And he's gonna tell us about some of his work about uh, quantum telescopy. So Robert. All right, so let's go. Essentially it will be this talk will be on the Finnish project, the Finnish project with the Grand National on the left hand side. And, uh, uh, and uh, it will deal with these two papers that resulted from the project the quantum telescopic clock games and quantum cubic circuits for quantum telescopes. Despite what the timeline says, actually, the second paper is this manuscript paper before the first paper, the first paper is actually the continuation. I will essentially want to get through the key achievements of this paper in the simplest possible way. That's my goal. The presentation is prepared in such a way that it's on YouTube that people at the level of probably PhD student in physics of the quantum course, such students will understand this presentation without uh, any trouble. Uh, let me start with some little presentation plan. First of all, I will make introduction based on like some sort of general trend that I observe with the devices that are being analyzed in quantum mechanics. After that, I will focus my attention on quantum enhanced telescopy, in particular, long baseline interferometry will be the field I'm interested in. I want to present uh, the challenges in that particular field. I will make, make the connection with quantum information science, and I will mention the notable protocols in that field. Finally, I'll move to the clock game, which I, I was really happy with. Essentially, I was really happy with that paper. I will formulate the problem. I will mention explicitly on what we try to solve. I will propose the winning strategy to the clock game, and I will mention something about the applications on why it is actually interesting. And in that case, let's go. And that I will have a very bad start because I will make a scientifically unjustified claim. In the sense, I will say that every de device can be made more interesting by making it quantum. And one of such devices I met uh, in my undergrad studies in the coast of Poland, where I read this paper in 2014, mentioned there, where they have built a quantum random number generator based on essentially pixels in mobile phone camera, which is slightly crazy when I read about it. Uh, another example of such devices are being analyzed within our group, which is we don't have to only deal with bridges. We can make the bridge quantum by making the work in fluid qubits instead of the standard uh, fluid. And our group turns out to be pretty good in analyzing such devices. So here are two examples of papers published within our group in that one. But I will focus on another type of device, which is the telescope. And as you can see, on the left-hand side, you have an example of a classical telescope that was, uh, that was uh, a part of the Heisen Event Horizon telescopy team. On the right-hand side, you have the proposal of quantum-enhanced telescopy scheme, which was, in fact, the first ever proposal of such scheme. You can see that on the left-hand side, you have actual picture. On the right-hand side, you have uh, just a simple circuit diagram, simplified diagram. And that's essentially sort of represent the state of the field at this point, which is the fact that we are at the stage of building the ideas, building foundations for quantum enhanced telescopy, rather than the actual setups are expected like many, many, many years later. Uh, you can see also that the field is fairly young. This uh, paper comes from 2012 barely over 10 years old. And, uh, and so the field is also not that old as well in that sense. We are at the stage of essentially mainly making such a proposal of quantum enhanced telescopy schemes that can hopefully work in the future. Uh, so let me formulate the problem a little bit, at least in this very simplified version in easiest possible way. What we are dealing with in this presentation is that we'll deal with long baseline interferometry. The deal is that we'll not have one telescope that collects the te stellar light, we'll have sets of multiple telescopes that collect the stellar light, but I will limit myself to just two. These telescopes are connected by a line that we call baseline, hence the name also long baseline interferometry, because these baselines can be fairly long, of the order of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers long. 
Uh, these telescopes collect light from a distant source that is later collected, brought together with each other, and somehow added up to each other through some like combination unit. At the end, what we expect is to observe some sort of detective power of the signal. This equation was taken from some elementary textbook on the field, where essentially the signal was interfered together, but uh, it contains the one feature that we want to observe in any kind of detector power within the signal. In particular, that signal is dependent on the parameter that we want to measure, which is the visibility, which is we would call the visibility. If we repeat the experiment, but we repeat it for a large enough set of baselines, then we'll note the visibility essentially as a function of the baseline. We'll have fair knowledge about it. And when Fourier transformed, that can be converted into source intensity profile. So really, in such setups, we are dealing with parameter estimation problem, where parameter to be estimated is the visibility. Uh, there are, however, limitations to such setups when it comes to classical scheme. And uh, one of such limitations is that uh, we need to work with fairly bright sources. Why is that? The reason is that if we bring this light with the combination unit, then obviously we don't want to lose this light. If we lose that light, then we lose the information about the visibility that we need to perform the whole protocol. And in particular, when we have single photons arriving from the distance source, which is fairly far-fetched approximation, but it is approximation being done, if the distance source is likely to provide us at least, at most, sorry, one photon per time then within which we analyze uh, within which we analyze arriving signal, then that photon can be lost and the protocol might not work at all. And we'll work essentially in such weak thermal light regime. In 2011 paper, it was shown by Mankai Tsang uh, that this uh, light, that if it arrives from us uh, into us from such distant source, it can be represented by this density matrix over here. And it constitutes of uh, essentially three big parts. One of them is the vacuum term that contains essentially nothing. So for every time when we analyze, we don't expect to get anything whatsoever from this star. The other, the second term is the single photon that arrives at us at our location with probability epsilon. And this single photon in its all diagonal terms will have the parameter we want to estimate, which is the visibility. Importantly, this visibility is a complex parameter. It will have amplitude and phase or real or imaginary parts. So we have two real parameters to be estimated. Hence, we are dealing with sort of multi-parameter estimation problem. And finally, the, the other terms, order of epsilon square terms, represent terms that are that uh, have two photons, three photons, et cetera, photons arriving from the star. And in general, these terms are being neglected. Where so far I have seen only one paper that dealt with two photon events, but in general, these are insignificant. Maybe you can say, Robert, before you go on, what, what do you want to learn about the distant source? What, what features are encoded in those parameters coming from the star that you're so interested in. In simplest possible terms, I simply want to learn its image. So just like for the event horizon telescope, like the key achievement, at least in my opinion, was to produce the image of that black hole that they had. In this particular case, we also learned about essentially image of the distance source. And the information about such image is encoded within this visibility, since later we can decode it through Fourier transform and advanced observing theorem. So that's why this parameter, this visibility is of huge interest within our problems. Mm. So that's our goal, essentially. We will want to estimate the visibility. We'll take it a bit simple in the sense that within the pre this presentation, we will not deal much with the errors that can occur along the way. We'll just want to present some basic principles of the protocols, except the spots where I explicitly mentioned the errors. And uh, finally, I will neglect the atmosphere effects in the sense I will neglect the way in which this visibility is modified as it travels from this distance source to the telescopes. So it's very, very simplified image. Well, still, it will represent the current state of the field, but, uh, but that's where we are at. Uh, so first of all, let me introduce you to the tools that we are using. Yep. 
Uh, so just to clarify, you so you're using so you're seeing visibility as a property of the source itself. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how you can understand it. Uh, so in this part, let me introduce you in this part of the presentation to the tools that are <laughs> used to analyze uh, different measurement schemes. First of them is fairly natural within the quantum metrology field, which is the notion of Fisher information and quantum Fisher information. In particular, on the left hand side, you have uh, Fisher information defined, which is a two by two matrix for a two parameter estimation problem. And in particular, uh, this matrix is dependent on the measurement setup. The sum of it that is being performed is the sum over different measurement results, uh, over probabilities of different measurement results. And uh, therefore, this sum is this sum and Fisher information is dependent on the measurement set. It quantifies how our setup is sensitive to the parameters we want to measure. It sort of quantifies the information about we get about these parameters. Uh, on the other hand, we have quantum Fisher information, which has slightly more complicated form. But in the end, if you look at it a bit closer, then you would see that, first of all, it is independent of the measurement setup. We don't have, like, for example, sum over such probabilities. We don't have any element in there that is dependent of the measurement setup. And moreover, uh, you, can, uh, you can show that it represents essentially the best possible fit scenario for us, in the sense that you are able to design a measurement setup for which Fisher information matches quantum Fisher information, then it means that you cannot do any better. Uh, the way we often look at it to sort of uh, to have toy model to deal with is to analyze not multi-parameter estimation problem, but single parameter estimation problem, where we want to set up the amplitude of the visibility to one, and we are interested uh, in just the phase estimation problem of phi. In this particular case, uh, the saturation of Fisher information is represented by this equation. If we achieve it, then we are dealing with an optimal measurement scheme. You will see later that the story is not that simple, but I'll, but you will see. So, why would we, we even want to care about the phase estimation problem? It essentially provides us with a toy model that is at least like remotely practical, which uh, essentially describes the point source. So we are we are now not dealing with distance source, but we are dealing with distant point source, and it turns out that for such problems we can set as I mentioned, g to one, we are we can remove this g out of this equation, and we are dealing only with the phase estimation problem, uh, which essentially the main purpose of such problem is that it simplifies the math. Yes. So the reason you're interested in the visibility as a whole is to get the basically a picture of the mm -hmm. yes. star or whatever. If you have a point source, you know in advance what that is. It's a point. Yeah. And so what, yes, what yes, information yes. are you getting from the phase now about the... And so the prior, the most important information that is encoded within the phase is essentially the distance, uh, uh, the distance difference between the source itself and telescope B and between the source and telescope A. Ah, okay. Just this difference is encoded within the phase. Uh, in the end, you can probe, you can learn the position of the source by repeating the experiment and uh, performing it for the, the two telescopes kind of at different locations for the, like uh, different locations in space. Uh, in the end, uh, the story gets slightly more complicated if we move to multi-parameter estimation problem, because if you will come back to the quantum function information definition, then we have these matrices L, these symmetric logarithmic derivatives, uh, that uh, enter this equation. These derivatives are defined uh, by the second equation on the left-hand side, and it turns out that if you solve for these derivatives, then you would observe that they do not commute. And there is an important uh, statement resulting from that one. It states that essentially it's impossible to saturate quantum Fisher information simultaneously for phi and g for a single measurement scheme. So that's why the problem kind of gets more interesting along the way, uh, because it's impossible to design such measurement setup to saturate quantum Fisher information. It's possible to design one that saturates it like separately for phi, separately for g, but it's impossible to do both of them simultaneously. Importantly, like this statement holds only in case we have single copy of a stellar photo. 
If we have multiple copies of the quantum states sitting over there, and it is possible to saturate, but within the protocols we will deal with over here, we'll assume that we have just one stellar photon and we have to do as good with it as possible. One comment there, Robert, if you go back. I, okay. I think the result in this paper you quote is that, is that if it does commute in some subspace, yeah, yeah. Then, then it is possible. It Either they don't commute, but if they commute in subspace, then you mm -hmm. can saturate both mm -hmm. uh, in some circumstances. Mm -hmm. It commutes on the anti support of uh, density matrix, right? Something exactly. Like that. exactly. Yeah, so within our purposes, Essentially, we found it to be enough, and they didn't find any paper kind of uh, would be able to determine what this one is like because I didn't know how to actually go beyond that restriction. Um, importantly, also, another tool that we <laughs> use uh, over there is uh, formulated within the framework of quantum information science. It was a very important fact to me because as I was working on the project and I came from quantum quantum mechanics background, not observational astronomy background, and this tool essentially allowed me to reformulate the problem of quantum telescopy into the framework that I actually knew, which was the quantum information science, quantum metrology. Uh, this made it significantly more convenient to work. In particular, if you observe the state of uh, every single arriving mode, telescopes and you'll see that there is either zero or one photon sitting within this equation. Hence, it might be beneficial to look at this setup as qubits. And this realization made it significantly helpful for me to work on this project. Such, uh, such uh, comparison between quantum information science and between quantum telescopy was for the first time made in especially Gottesman's paper. Uh, so that's essentially the idea, work with T modes as qubits and work with the, frame, with the framework of quantum information science. And in that case, uh, you can essentially use essentially everything you learned uh, with T quantum information, just translate the problem on the left hand side into quantum circuit on the left, right hand side. These quantum informations will be some sort of gates that uh, act essentially like in quantum computer on qubits provided by the source and possibly by the other qubits. We might want to introduce some restrictions on these quantum operations and uh, let's uh, continue analyzing it in a bit more detail. In particular, uh, one naive approach uh, that we can take to essentially solve such problem is uh, to bring these modes physically together. It was uh, like, it can work if the setup is ideal, but again, as I mentioned, uh, due to the transmission losses that can occur as the photons transfer to the baseline, these photons can be essentially lost. And that's why in many papers, there is the restriction that uh, one does not allow to bring the photons physically together, or in other words, one does not establish a quantum channel between the telescopes. Uh, hence, uh, if we will introduce these quantum operations, then we'll also not allow to establish a quantum link between telescopes. Uh, second, uh, Mankai Tsang in his paper introduced an important notion of local and non-local setups in quantum enhanced telescopy, where local setups are characterized by two elements. First of all, they have no quantum link between them, and second, they have no shift entangled state. If at least one of the equations uh, conditions above is violated, then we are dealing with a non-local setup. And what uh, Tsang has also shown, which was the main result of his paper, is that uh, the scaling of fissure information is significantly worse for local than non-local setups. For the local ones, uh, essentially, you cannot do any better than to scale fission information like epsilon square, while for non-local setups, we can achieve the significantly better scaling of epsilon. Just to remind you, epsilon is the small parameter, is uh, the probability of the stellar photon arriving from the star. Uh, so we have already established that we don't want to create a physical link between the telescopes. So the only other option allowed to us by this little analysis is essentially to distribute a shared entangled state between telescope A and telescope B. And for that reason, like since that quantum state will need to be distributed over big baseline, then we expect that we would need to establish quantum repeater network uh, to make that scheme work. 
Hence, uh, the development of quantum enhanced telescopy will require the development of the repeater networks in order for it to work. Uh, another restriction that we can impose on our setups is that we can allow linear or nonlinear operations to, to be performed as quantum operations locally at the telescope locations. In particular, the linear operations do not create or destroy photons. If you have zero photons in, you get zero photons out. If you have one photon in, you get one photon out, etc. And uh, the reason why this restriction is imposed sometimes is that uh, such operations are expected to be simple to perform because they are represented by elements like beam splitters, phase shifters, and uh, we don't need any nonlinear operations for them, which can be complicated. Uh, the first ever example of such setups that essentially realizes the description mentioned by me before is the proposal of Gottesman and collaborators. So it's essentially this uh, picture on the right hand side is, uh, I would even say, close to a birthplace of quantum enhanced telescopy. Essentially, what you are dealing with is that, except of the source that is providing the uh, the density matrix, the telescope A and telescope B, you have also an entangled ancilla. Ancilla, just the entangled state of single photon that is either provided to the telescope on the right or telescope on the left. Uh, later, this entangled state is interfered by these beam splitters at telescope locations, and one observes various probabilities of clicks at these detectors. In the end, if we look closely at it, then uh, and we'll observe that these probabilities indeed depend uh, uh, on the parameters we want to measure, which are g, amplitude of visibility, and phi to phase of visibility. Uh, so as I mentioned, quantum repeater network is likely to be needed for practical telescope setups, but for the early setups, uh, that uh, that requirement is not needed in the sense that we expect that the first ever demonstration of the telescopy protocol will not be done for a start. It will be done on a lab table. And on a lab table, such, uh, such quantum repeater network will not be necessary. Uh, moreover, uh, half of the stellar photons do not provide information about the visibility. In the sense, if you were to look closely at this equation, then you would observe that these probabilities add up to epsilon over two, not, uh, uh, so it's very small. They don't add up to one. The remaining y minus epsilon term is the vacuum term from the start, but don't provide any information about the incoming photons. And there is also the remaining epsilon over two term that represents the half of the stellar photons being wasted. So why are such events happening? It is essentially the case that uh, if we have a stellar photon that arrives at the right telescope, and if you have terrestrial photon arriving also at the right telescope, you are dealing with Hong Kong Mandel events. And within the scheme of Gottesman and collaborators, such events do not provide any information about the visibility. So I also could include these events and these probabilities, but they will be just constant, irrelevant for visib visibility estimation. Robert, Robert, do you go back to the slide? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so maybe just a comment. So in your EPR pair there, this is, the zero represents a va vacuum yeah, and one represents it's, one photon. Exactly. Right? And it's also important also to match the frequencies of your emitted photons with the frequency of the light coming in from this. Yes, yes. Right? Essentially, by matching these frequencies, you select the frequencies of incoming stellar light you want to analyze, because otherwise they would simply not interfere each other with each other at the beam split. Right, and so you, then you want to get an interference between the stellar photon and the terrestrial photon in your detectors. So that's the idea. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, and moreover, uh, there's a final problem. Like, as you mentioned, Andrew, we want to get this interference with these stellar photons. In order to have this interference, we need terrestrial photons ready for every single time when we want to analyze the uh, stellar source. And the problem is uh, that we need to have large enough set of events in order to actually be able to estimate these probabilities from frequencies of the right events. However, all of that needs to be done within a period of time over which the visibility over here stays stable. And 
The deal is that if we introduce the atmosphere, if you introduce the air rotation, in particular the atmosphere, then the such period of time over this parameter remains stable. It's of the order of 10 milliseconds. Within this 10 millisecond uh, time, you need to do all of it. Hence, you essentially need to have a lot of EPR pairs ready in order to perform this experiment multiple times in order to estimate these probabilities within such short time window. It essentially that restriction, this necessity of large entanglement distribution rate, is the main problem, the main limitation that make that might make the Gottesman protocol and Gottesman like protocols possibly impractical in the future. So they will be the first ones to be demonstrate, demonstrated on the lab tables, because on a lab table you don't have atmosphere and you don't need such large entanglement distribution rate, but in practice it might get tricky. This is the most difficult limitations possibly in the field. Uh, on the other hand, like let's still continue with the analysis, the future slides essentially will be dealing with lifting of the second problem and lifting of the third problem. That will be the key achievements of the papers that I will represent later. Uh, importantly, uh, what we have also shown that the Gottesman protocol is, uh, is an optimal protocol. Essentially, if one limits uh, themselves to just one entangled pair, as the ancilla, or to linear elements that are being performed over here. And we have shown that essentially with such limitations, uh, Gottesman has done essentially the best possible job. So if we go, want to go beyond the Gottesman protocol, then we need to do something significantly different. We need to lift these limitations, and I will show uh, how it can be done. So what, for one of our papers, we have shown that if one introduces like additional pair of these quantum computation operations, then suddenly one makes use of all of these stellar photons, not of just half of them. In particular, if you look at this setup more closely, then you would observe that if you were to remove the parity checks and if you were to remove the node gates from here, then you would recover exactly the Gottesman probe. So these, these gates are essentially the new elements. And if you were to propagate this, uh, this stellar photon and the disentangled ancilla through such circuit, then you would observe a set again of the probabilities dependent on the uh, visibility that we want to estimate. The problem, however, is uh, well, the, there is a problem appearing that will be also present with the other setups, which, which is that if you want to improve, if you want to add more quantum elements, then you have more quantum elements that you need to deal with. And in particular, in this case, we have the not gate. And if we keep the stellar photon modes as optical and the ancilla state again as a photon, then it turns out that such not gate that either creates or destroys the stellar photon within a given mode in a controlled manner, it's simply what was not proposed yet, even theoretically, not to mention experimental. So it's uh, that's why. This is, uh, if such gate was developed, well, it would intri introduce an interest in quantum computation element that would help us definitely. And within this setup, it would be definitely helpful. Like one of this, the ideas that may make this setup practical is essentially to change the type of qubits. So if you cannot perform the not gate on an optical qubit, you might want to do it on some other type of qubits, like convert it into something else. And such conversion of transaction may possibly make similar setups practical. But in particular, uh, the not gaze protocol introduces these not gates that either create or destroys the stellar photon in a given mode. Therefore, it is a nonlinear element. And that's how we show that uh, the inclusion of nonlinear elements essentially can make use of all in common stellar photons, not just half of them. And that one represents essentially the key result of that particular paper. Uh, in, maybe it's to comment there. Mm -hmm. So when you check the parity, you're checking you're checking the parity. You know, if the total number of photons is even or odd, mm -hmm. and, and, and then you don't distinguish between the stellar photon yeah. or the terrestrial photon. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. So essentially, in here, uh, these parity checks realize two roles. Uh, first of all, they have they verify 
the arrival or non-arrival of the stellar photons. So in particular, you would observe that within all of these equations, the final, the purple and the red events have to agree. The E represents even odd, represents odd. And uh, second, they verified the arrival with, of the stellar photon without destroying the information of, about the visibility. So they perform kind of non-demolition of measurement, verifying the arrival of the stellar photon. This will be also an important idea that we'll want to realize later with more complicated protocols. Uh, to describe these protocols in a bit more detail, I'll introduce the notion of uh, unary and non-unary protocols, the term that was for the first time used in the kavi Boulin paper mentioned on a kind of middle on the right-hand side of this slide. And in particular, unary protocols perform a measurement run uh, for every single time within, we, within which we want to analyze the stellar source. As I mentioned, to perform the measurement run, you need an entangled state to do it. Hence, uh, the unary protocols uh, essentially perform such runs with high frequency and therefore they will need a high frequency of entanglement distribution within them. Uh, Kavi Boulin introduced another idea of non-unary protocols where you perform a single measurement run that swipes over many time bits. And uh, in particular, he makes an additional assumption that within these time bits, the stellar source is weak enough to provide the photon only within one of such time bits. And uh, this is the key assumption within the Kavi Boulin paper. So essentially, we get repeated assumption of the weakness of the stellar source little probability of the stellar photon arrival. And uh, now let me go through the key ideas within the kabi boulin paper. So here is essentially the kabi boulin protocol represents for three times. This is just like, the reason why it is just three is that it's the first non-trivial trade case that can be actually at least represented on a picture that takes relatively small size. Uh, in particular, uh, the key idea within the paper is that uh, one of the steps within the protocol is to encode the stellar photon arrival time then in binary onto these entangled pairs mentioned by this phi plus phi plus. So essentially, this circuit will extract the time then in binary representation, and such extraction will be done at the measurement step uh, on these blue nodes. Once that one knows the time bin, then one knows what to do with the stellar modes, the orange modes, and the green modes, these vacuum modes that are later being modified in order to extract the visibility. But uh, in particular, the key ideas that I want to mention is that protocol is non-unary, it swipes over many time bins. Second, the binary encoding of the time bin onto another set of uh, qubits. And, uh, uh, third, it is also an important feature, is that the bind, time bin estimation and the visibility estimation are done within one quantum circle. And that will be the case also for, for a larger set of nine times. If we were to expand this protocol onto a larger set, uh, onto more time bins, then we would uh, simply need to introduce more of such vacuum qubits and more of such entangled pairs. And, and entangled pairs would serve uh, Two to the power n minus one times. Importantly, this number seems large, but it's limited by the fact that we need to expect at most one photon arrival within these time bins. And, uh, and second important feature, essentially, this circuit uh, realizes both tasks of visibility estimation and time bin estimation, like as uh, within a single circuit. Uh, important. Uh, within the clock game that we have introduced in our next paper, uh, we have slightly different goal to what I mentioned before, because what I was talking about uh, all over this presentation is visibility, visibility. The goal is to determine the information about the visibility. And now I'm saying, okay, let's take a step, step back, essentially. Let's just determine the stellar photon arrival time bin. Let's just perform this task. Let's do it in a way that is non-destructive, that does not destroy information about the visibility. And hopefully we get something interesting out of it. So essentially what I want to do by the clock game I'm about to propose soon is that I just want to say, has the stellar photon arrived? Yes or no, if it has, when it has done it. 
And if it has done it, then we can do something else that open to the domain of the visibility. So let's observe how uh, it is done. This is a very similar circuit. Some elements are a bit simplified, but this circuit essentially represents clothing. So we have, again, very similar setup, which is the stellar source uh, providing the density matrix on the telescope 1 and B. It's later interfered with the ancilla by some quantum gate and after which uh, all of the modes are being measured. Importantly, however, right now the ancilla is not a set of qubits uh, that is uh, that is there. It's essentially a pair of qubits, D-level system. Importantly, for a system that have D levels, we can examine at most D minus one times that is one. One of the features of that protocol. So ancilla is essentially a set of qubits. Therefore, the Zn gate that is sitting over there is not a qubit gate, it's a qubit gate, uh, gate. So it's something slightly more complicated, but not much. It's a simple extension. What that gate does is that uh, essentially at the gate step, we have the encoding step. So it encodes the timing onto the ancilla. The Fourier basis measurement will be the decoding step. So Fourier basis measurement uh, essentially <laughs> decodes the timing from the ancilla. The control ZN gate is simple phase shift gate, essentially. So it is being performed only if the corresponding state of the stellar mode is one. If it's zero, then nothing is being done on the, on the, ancil on the ancilla. And it is a simple phase shift that has this parameter N later encoded. What happens later, what it does is essentially that it does magic to these uh, ancilla qubits because when we perform the Fourier basis measurement and observe the results x and y b at each telescope, then we can just add up these results in module d algebra and we recover the time when exactly, which is just like very amazing feature of the math that is happening along the way. So we have the timing, encoding, and decoding procedure. And uh, this is essentially it. This is essentially the clock game. It has some very, very important features. So at this point, you might slightly object, OK, but what about the visibility? Like, I haven't mentioned anything at all. How do we even measure it once we have timing? And uh, the important thing about it is that the clock game doesn't deal with it. Essentially, what you can, uh, we essentially just estimate the timing and leave the visibility measurement uh, to the experimentalists. So if someone designs a method of visibility measurement that is practical for them, makeable and feasible, then one is free to choose it, which is a very convenient thing to do. Uh, the clock game, moreover, therefore can be used as a subroutine in other quantum enhanced elasticity schemes. So these elements that are sort of not blurred within this procedure as is the clock game subroutine that you can use later within any quantum enhanced telescope that you would like to use. Uh, second, uh, the visibility measurement is significantly simplified because what happens along the way is that the clock game tells us stellar photon has arrived. It has done at this time, bend, and within this time, bend, you are dealing with the essentially second and third line of the quantum state over here. So the important thing that is happening is that the closed clock game post selects that part of the state and gets rid of this huge vacuum term that stands in the first line. This vacuum term is essentially the reason why the visibility measurement is essentially tricky. And if we don't have large vacuum term, hopefully measurement will be simpler as well. Uh, third feature that we observe is that uh, uh, the clock game is optimal in terms of entanglement consumption. So essentially, in that sense, uh, if you were to tell me at this point, OK, but can I realize Suppose that I can form a qubit out of, for example, this number of qubits. Can I do better? Can I reduce the number of qubits to perform such protocol? And the answer is no. Uh, this, is, uh, this is actually a feature that uh, the clock game shares with the Kabulin protocol. 
in the sense that both Kabibulin and the clock game are optimal in terms of entanglement consumption. Well, however, their procedure cannot be used as subroutine for other protocol, our scan, and their procedure is not formulated in the language of qubits, it is formulated in the language of qubits, and possibly that's why our procedure can utilize other pieces of quantum information that might be developed in the future. So it's another, another advantage that we have over here. Importantly, however, visibility measurements uh, in principle should not require uh, should not require essentially uh, entanglement. So, for example, uh, one of such uh, schemes for visibility measurement is simply measurement of the stellar modes in the X basis, which should be fairly successful once I once one performs the post selection. But in general, many ideas for the visibility measurement do not require entanglement. The only step within the clock game that should require entanglement is the clock game itself. And since that step is optimal in terms of entanglement consumption, then any protocol that one chooses to do that uses the clock game is optimal in terms of entanglement consumption as well. So it is also another feature, nice feature of the protocol and uh, the other nice feature is that the clock game is also nicely scalable to a sets uh, to sets of many telescopes. So I have just the expansion of the clock game from two to three telescopes, where for two telescopes we have just entangled state of two qubits. Here we have uh, entangled state of three qubits that is essentially very similar. Instead of zero zero plus one one, we have zero 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 plus one one one, etc. So fairly straightforward expansion. And uh, later when one performs the measurement on the right-hand side in Fourier basis, then one performs a very similar procedure to decode the timing, which is again, the modulo the algebra and addition of the results will be enough. So nice generalization of uh, this protocol. And that essentially concludes this presentation. So just to conclude what we have done over here, in particular, our key achievements, is that for Gottesman protocol, uh, we have demonstrated that it is an optimal protocol if one has just one entangled qubit pair and uh, linear elements available. For node-based protocol, we have demonstrated how the nonlinear elements can be used to go beyond the Gottesman protocol, how the nonlinear elements can be used uh, to essentially make Gottesman protocol better. And uh, for a clock game, also, we have introduced something that works, can be used as a subroutine for other quantum enhanced telescope schemes uh, for that is optimal in terms of entanglement consumption. And uh, finally, the feature that I didn't mention within this presentation is that uh, if, you read, uh, like if you read the actual paper, then you will see that we formulate the clock game not in the language of telescopy, it's the paper essentially like formulated strictly within the quantum information science language. It's a quantum information protocol that is, has application within the desktop. So it's possible that such protocol will find applications outside telescopy, but at this point, it's uh, not self-evident to us what these applications would be. And uh, at this point, I would like to thank you for your attention. Certain papers that are used for this presentation, and uh, that's it from me. Yeah, uh, thanks for the nice talk, Robert. Uh, so, my understanding of the Kodasman protocol from your talk is that you need uh, photons. Uh, in lab because you want to generate an entangled qubit pair. Photons in lab. Uh, so what do you mean by distinction in lab? In the sense you need a central lab to generate these photons or? Uh, yeah. Uh, like uh, photons separate from the one coming from the stars. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. You need this and another source of this. In this particular case, entangled photons uh, rather than only the stellar state. Essentially, you cannot. Uh, like as I mentioned before, like these, stellar, these terrestrial photons provide the entanglement that uh, like it essentially provides the entanglement that uh, allows you to go beyond what you can do with locals. It allows you to extract more information about the star from each and common stellar photon. 
there are protocols, importantly, uh, that, uh, uh, that don't have that element, that have essentially only the source, telescope A, telescope B, uh, inter, that don't have any terrestrial entanglement. In many cases, however, these protocols will be uh, sort of the photo protocols. So if you don't mind drawing on the whiteboard. So one of such papers is that essentially it was fairly simple conceptual scheme so that you have two sources, you have again two telescopes, both sources can provide the lights to the telescope, but in order for that particular proposal of these authors to work, you have to have the photon from here meeting with photon from here. And since each of them emits uh, the light with probability that is roughly of the order of epsilon, small epsilon, and they meet with each other with probability epsilon square. Hence, it's very unlikely that the viewer scheme will provide any information about the star, vast minority of, about the star, stars in this case. The vast majority of the events essentially didn't do well in their particular protocol. And uh, that's that's why essentially it's tricky. Essentially, all of the schemes, uh, like so, like a bit deviating from your from your question. Like uh, at some point, Andrew, you asked me like a question: Why the scaling is of the order of epsilon square over here with insufficient information and epsilon for non-local setups? And my best guess for that, as I was thinking about it, is that it's possible that such scaling is achieved because epsilon square represents sort of two photon events in our scale. Like two photons from that source meeting with each other, possibly interfering with each other. Although it's unclear how, but maybe that's the reason why essentially we are dealing with two photon events that may contribute towards special information, but it's going kind of far. I deviated from your question, sorry. Um, no, yeah, uh, that's helpful. Uh, uh, another thing I was wondering was that uh, when you talked about the necessity of uh, introducing nonlinear elements, mm -hmm. uh, not gets, and you said uh, uh, optical non gets uh, can be realized. Yes. I was wondering, so basically, if you can convert the optical I think you've briefly touched upon this. Mm -hmm. that yes, you yes. Convert it to microwave. You can probably realize it in a dual rail basis. Mm -hmm. That's one of the ideas that can make that such non-linear protocols practical and such case practical. But uh, I haven't explored it that much. Actually, I have to explore it sort of more on the protocol level rather than like the practical level in that case. So I cannot expand on that, but for sure, like. Uh, with the current state of theory, it's, it's highly likely that if this protocol will be practical, it will be practical with the transduction of the optical qubit into something else. Right. And so I wanted to say um, earlier on, you, were, you talked about um, the possibility of tabletop uh, experimental mm -hmm. demonstrations, and you said that none had been done yet. Um, so it's being done right now at this point because, like, uh, for the project uh, that I mentioned, like, one of the parts of that uh, grant was essentially our part, like, building these protocols that go beyond what this one in Kabibuli. The other part of the protocol that was done by, uh, uh, by Reimer's group and Paul Gas group as well uh, was to build such tabletop present uh, demonstrations of. Uh, got this one protocol, and I believe that along the way hey, they had decent, like, intermediate results for that. I see. I was wondering why it hadn't been done yet because the Gottesman protocol seems straight, relatively straightforward compared to things that have already been done. Yes. Um, but but they, but there's some, are there some particular difficulties in implementing it? That you know? Yeah, but I would expect. I'm not sure if Paul published anything like an experiment. Nothing has been published yet. There is a group also in Long Island, I think, that's working on this as well at a distance, trying to do like long distance uh, experiments along these lines. Stony Brook, huh? yeah, but just to clarify for like the rest of you, like the reason why such table 
like why this is the Gottesman protocol that might be demonstrated is that essentially all of the technical difficulties that are present within the telescopy, real telescopy protocols that we want to avoid are not present on the lab table. We don't have the atmospheric fluctuation time, and therefore we don't need large entanglement distribution rate. You can do it fairly slowly in such states that are demonstrated uh, by that are needed for Gottesman protocol. Let me pull up the right slide. Yeah. The state over here can be simply generated by pushing single photon through a beam splitter and applying a phase shifter on one of the arms. So it's not a difficult operation, it's fairly makeable. Uh, we don't need the repeater network because we don't need to transfer the photon over a long distance. All of the elements are fairly easy, hence the tabletop presentation it feels completely made. I mean, I was also thinking that you can use the same laser to generate your entangled pair as you use to reflect off the thing that you're trying to image, um, and, you know, something like that, and then you don't have to do phase matching of different sources and things like that. Yeah, I believe that, uh, I believe that Paul's setup was done very similar notion. Yeah, I think they wanted to make, they wanted to make it a mixed state, so I think they sent okay. their light through ground glass or something like that to, to make a, to make it an incoherent. Low, low light level source. Um, you, you, I don't think you mentioned the memory results, right? Maybe you could maybe say uh, the, the quantum memory stuff. Yeah, there was actually not much on that end. Yeah, so, so maybe you could just say in words uh, what, what we did for this quantum memory business. Uh, so essentially on that end, we just uh, introduced, like, we just introduced the restrictions on the protocol that we want to introduce, but like quantum memories, I didn't achieve like enough results for me to share them. So that sounds bad, but unfortunately that's the way it is. Well, we had this factor of two, I thought, improvement in the number of, of qubits required. Uh, in the number of qubits required, essentially. Uh, so that factor of two, maybe it's some sort of misunderstanding. Uh, that factor of two was uh, achieved within the node-based protocol in the sense that uh, half more stellar photons are used for phase estimation rather than the, uh, rather than the Gottesman right. protocol. Uh, within the memory, like the only comment that I get about it is that uh, uh, at some point, the clock game simply, so essentially the stellar state, at some point, it either needs to be stored at that moment for the time that it takes to perform the clock game subroutine. And after the clock game subroutine is performed, only 10, uh, uh, then only 10 one kind of gas manipulations with the stellar source with the visibility measurement because one actually knows what to do. Uh, so hence the memory might be needed. Another uh, strategy about it is that one can reduce the requirement of memory by performing the visibility measurement within every single time in, within which one expects the stellar photon to arrive. It should be makeable because for such measurements, we don't need entanglement anymore. So it's fairly simpler. And uh, that's how this memory requirement can be lifted. So you either perform a single run of visibility measurement, but we need to store the stellar state over here for the time of uh, performing the clock game or you need to you perform many of such measurements with the visibility and you post select the one that corresponds to the stellar photon arrival and the way you post select is determined by the clock game result. So maybe there was possibly some confusion on that fact. But, uh... All right, any more questions? Let's thank Robert again.